parents, my grandparents, um, my parents, uh, and also because I have a commitment and a responsibility to my children and my children's children. Um, and so I'm honored to, to have been invited to, uh, to say this land acknowledgement today. Um, and, you know, I've been, uh, I was watching the, the inauguration earlier, you know, and, um, and just reflecting on a lot of things, on a lot of things, you know, and um, an acknowledgement, the word itself, acknowledgement is a recognition of facts, you know, and so as we, as we speak of land acknowledgements, is recognition of facts, right? Like not just romanticize words um, or, or things to have on a checklist, you know, but acknowledgements um, in, a, in a native way is when we recognize our truths, um, however harsh or however beautiful they might be. Uh, and in that recognition, it also comes to, to acknowledge and to recognize um, the sacrifice of those that have come before us, uh, those that are, are walking amongst us, and the, and the hardships that our children are going to, are going to endure. Um, so as we, as we sit here today, <clears throat> and in this land acknowledgement is acknowledging um, all that love, all that love that has been put in by our ancestors for us to be here, and is acknowledging um, their struggles. Um, is acknowledging the land itself. Uh, it's acknowledging our relationship with the land uh, for us not to forget um, that as we, as we walk, we walk with our ancestors because they go back to this land. They feed, they feed those little critters. They, you know, they feed the plants, you know, so as we walk in this, this day, um, we acknowledge all our gifts, all our blessings, and we acknowledge um, their sacrifices as well. Um, so an acknowledgement of the land is an acknowledgement of the people. Thank you. Thank you, Ixley. Um, well, I'm excited that today is here, not just Inauguration Day, but um, by all of you coming to this webinar, you're taking action to start bridging the divides and to build better relationships in our region. The project I'm working on is the Community Information Exchange and it's named Connect to Community Network. Our goal is to strengthen the coordination of care by connecting people, service organizations and community partners more quickly and more effectively, resulting in a he healthier, more equitable community for all. I'll paste my email into the chat if you'd like to learn more about that project. Over a year ago, we recognized that as we build this connected community network, we must honor tribal data sovereignty. We searched for several months and found our expert to provide guidance. She recommended that together as a community, we learn what has led up to the inequity that we see today and to learn new ways of thinking that we can embed into all of our work. With awareness and practice using the frameworks that we'll learn about today, we can build and improve relationships and honor data justice in all that we do for all people. We are recording this session so that we can share this valuable information with our community. We'll post the link to the recording on the Healthier Here website, and please feel free to share it with your colleagues. Our format for today is going to be one hour of remarks by our guest speaker, followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. It's my honor to introduce to you Dr. Desi rodriguez Lombear. She is a social demographer and a professor of sociology and American Indian studies at UCLA. Her research examines the intersection of race, indigeneity, data, and inequality. She has partnered with indigenous communities in the US and internationally as a researcher and data advocate for more than 10 years. She directs the Data Warriors Lab, an indigenous social science laboratory, is the co-founder of the US Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network, 
and serves on the board of directors for the Sovereign Bodies Institute, which stewards the missing and murdered indigenous women's database. He is a citizen of the Northern Cheyenne Nation and was born and raised on Cheyenne homelands in southeastern Montana. So with that, I would like to hand the mic over to Desi. Great, thank you, Lisa. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, well, uh, good day, everybody. Um, thanks for that introduction, Lisa. And thank you, all of you, for being here. I know it's a huge day, um, you know, in, the, in our country. Um, I don't know how many of you were watching the inauguration. I was kind of in and out of it, but there were some powerful words. Um, I think there's a lot of hope at the same time. Um, you know, as indigenous peoples, I think it's it's ever, um, it, there's a constant reminder, right? That um, we continue to live um, on our homelands in a time that um, when, you know, we are con continue to be under, uh, occupation and that in the forces of invasion are still here and there was no indigenous land acknowledgement there was no um, you know native nations were not present on that stage today um, and so that is a constant reminder to me as an indigenous woman of where we fit and don't fit into this into this united states government um, but i i want to um Thank all of you for being here. We're going to be talking about indigenous data. We're going to be talking about tribal sovereignty. We're going to talk about being good allies, what equity means, um, what sovereignty means, and um, and how these uh, concepts and understandings can be built into your work and the work that you do in service to the communities um, that you care for. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen here. Um, one moment. Okay, so um, the title of today is called Reframing Health Equity uh, and Data Justice Through This Lens of Indigenous Sovereignty. Um, I just want to introduce myself in my language. Um, um, my Cheyenne name is Mokshihat, which translates to bear mint woman. I'm a citizen of Northern Cheyenne Nation and Chicana. And um, all of the, the good words, uh, I want to thank Lisa for introducing me. I won't, uh, I won't go into more detail there. Um, I want to acknowledge where I am right now. Um, one of the silver linings of this pandemic for me is my ability to be here on my homelands on the Northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation in Southeastern Montana. So I want to acknowledge uh, my ancestors, the Tisistas and the Sukta people, um, and all of the ancestors who gave everything for us to still be here. And um, at some point I'll make my way back to Los Angeles, but I'm very honored to be able to serve in the capacity of a relative and a community member um, at this time in our community when things are very, very difficult. Um, COVID has hit us very hard as it has many indigenous uh, communities across the country. So I have a few goals for this webinar. One, I wanna uh, to really dive into who are indigenous peoples? Who are we talking about when we use this term indigenous? Um, particularly within the United States context. I want to talk about indigenous health disparities and data disparities um, and how those go hand in hand and how I believe that one of the solutions to both health disparities and data disparities is uh, indigenous sovereignty, tribal sovereignty. I want to talk about how there are solutions to both in, in tribal sovereignty and that we need to shift the paradigm from equity to sovereignty in our work. Uh, regardless of what sphere you're in, what industry, what uh, area you work in. Um, thinking, shifting from equity to sovereignty, particularly in uh, working with indigenous peoples is uh, critical. And finally, um, really touching on what is indigenous data sovereignty and governance and how can you start to um, be cognizant of and perhaps begin to implement some of these practices and principles. I'd like to start by saying that, you know, across the globe, there is this narrative, this um, quest for equity, 
whether it be health equity, economic equity, housing equity, um, including data equity. Uh, but for indigenous peoples, there is no equity and there is no justice without sovereignty. And so we need to really start to think about what does sovereignty mean? What does health sovereignty, data sovereignty, economic sovereignty, um, what does that mean for indigenous peoples and how does that impact the work that we do as non-indigenous allies, as non-indigenous organizations, as well as uh, indigenous peoples, indigenous organizations, um, intertribal entities. Um, and ultimately that sovereignty starts and ends with relationships. And so no matter what we do, relationships are at the core uh, of how we do what we do. Um, and I want to talk about what being a good relative means in this, um, in this context. So first I want to uh, just dive in to this uh, question, who are indigenous peoples, right? Um, oftentimes people ask this question, should I use American Indian? Should I say Native American? Should I say indigenous? Should I use the tribal affiliation? Um, what is the right word or the right term? And um, I want to push back on this question and, and tell you guys that these questions are best answered by the communities and the people themselves. Um, this is, is, is where you can start that relationship. At the end of the day, relationships must start somewhere. And I think this is a good question, you know, to start um, if you haven't already to ask people, what do you prefer that, you know, what term do you prefer? How, how should I refer to you and your people? Um, uh, and so for me, uh, you know, and I'll only answer for me, I identify uh, as an indigenous woman. Um, I, I, did, I identify as a Cheyenne woman. So I prefer that kind of global indigenous term. Um, and that's because I do a lot of work internationally. I work with a lot of different indigenous peoples, not just those in the United States. Um, but first and foremost, that the tribal, my tribal belonging and affiliation and responsibility is paramount. Um, and so others may differ, but that is a, a fantastic way of opening up that conversation and to start building that relationship. Um, and so I want to talk about why it's so important that we ask these questions. Um, and there maybe, you, you know, they might create discomfort. You know, one might think, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to seem, you know, like I don't know, or I don't want to say the wrong thing or, um, but if we don't ask those questions, we end up where we're at right now, which is, here's an example. This is a CNN. Um, I don't know if, how many of you guys saw this. It, it caused a big ruckus uh, in the indigenous world, at least. Um, but uh, this was an exit poll that CNN had run um, after the election in November. And as you see here, you know, we've got, okay, white voters, we, you know, voted 65% for the president. That was, you know, um, that had to come in already. The Latinx voters, you know, black voters, Asian voters. And then there was this category of something else, right? And indigenous peoples were thinking, is that what we are? Is that where we fit into this United States um, system of classifications? And um, is that really all we are? And, um, and so there was a lot of um, anger and rightfully so, I think, it's also, there was also a lot of humor. Um, and I think that's something that um, those of you that are indigenous, those of you that work with indigenous peoples, um, you know, we we use humor um, as a means, I think, of uh, of coping, of um, surviving. And so the the tons of memes that followed from this, I think, um, uh, are are pretty awesome. So I'd encourage you guys to look at those. But the bigger policy implications of this are that we are absent. Indigenous peoples are erased from uh, this mainstream um, narrative of who counts, right? Who's selecting the president of this country? Who belongs? Whose voice is worth recording? Um, and so my takeaway from this is to just encourage you all to please ask. Um, and so I want to give a def couple of definitions um, and kind of frame this globally and go from the global to the local. But there are over 370 million indigenous peoples across the world in 70 countries. 
and uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is this um, global instrument that um, many of us in our work refer to um, for a lot of rights-based um, uh, policies and rights-based practices. Um, but the United Nations Forum, uh, Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues has established a set of guidelines for who is indigenous. And so um, this is of course not the be all end all, but it is a international document and an international statement that a lot of us draw on. But it says uh, that self-identification as indigenous peoples at the individual level is required as well as being accepted by the community. So this kind of reciprocal, who claims you and who do you claim? Um, there's a there must be a historical continuity with pre-colonial and or pre-settler societies, and that there must be a strong link to territories and to natural resources. The UN also says that uh, there must be distinct social, economic, or political systems, um, that Indigenous peoples have distinct languages and cultures and beliefs, that they form non-dominant groups of society. Now, non-dominant does not just mean demographically. I mean, the Indigenous peoples could be the majority in terms of the population, but non-dominant groups in terms of their access to power structures, um, and that they resolve to maintain and reproduce their ancestral environments and their systems as distinct peoples and communities. So their desire to be recognized and acknowledged as separate, as distinct. In the, uh, in the United States, um, we see here, I, I wanted to kind of position these two, sl uh, two slides so that you see that there is a difference between populations and peoples. Peoples meaning this collective entity, this, this group that one belongs to that also confers belonging. Um, populations being just, you know, this self-identified um, uh, category. So in the U.S., there are um, American Indian and Alaska Native. Uh, this category is referred to as the American Indian and Alaska Native population. And so you'll see, you know, across the United States, according to the United States Census, where American Indians and Alaska Natives reside. But if we think about shifting from populations to peoples, we start getting at the distinctiveness of, of indigenous peoples, the belonging, the connection to land, to a collective. Um, we, we, we get at this notion of, of um, kinship. And so um, the difference here is we see the different peoples that are collected in the United States Census. So we have different uh, tribal peoples, Cherokee, Navajo, Choctaw, uh, Mexican American Indian, which is, um, in my opinion, incorrect that at the end of the day, that is an aggregate grouping, that there are hundreds of uh, indigenous peoples and nations in Mexico that deserve to be recognized under this category. Um, but you'll see here how it's been collapsed. Um, and that really serves, um, I think, to advance, again, this erasure of uh, indigenous peoples beyond the, the, the borders of the United States, um, you know, Central and South American indigenous peoples who continue to be erased and disenfranchised as well. Um, but this is just to kind of show you guys that there is a difference between populations and peoples. And um, this definition, however, is really important. There's a federal definition of who identify, uh, who belongs to this category. So the Office of Management of Budget in the United States establishes these, these categories and these definitions. And according to the federal government, American Indian or Alaska Native is a person having origins in any of the original peoples of North and South America, including Central America, and who maintains tribal affiliation or some sort of community attachment. So you'll see in this federal definition, the actual definition of the United States government of who belongs and who counts as American Indian and Alaska Native, that Central and South American indigenous peoples are included. And that's really important because um, the kind of recent waves of migration on this, at the Southern border of this country, we're seeing an increase in indigenous peoples coming from Central in South America. Um, they don't speak Spanish. They speak their indigenous language. Um, the degrees of marginalization are, are, are just so um, 
tremendous for these uh, these populations because they're coming over without any rights in their home country, completely disenfranchised there, um, and then they get to the border here and they're not recognized as American Indian or Alaska Native, though this federal definition includes them in some way. So there's a lot of legal implications um, that fall from this that need to really be um, addressed moving forward. But I want to encourage you all in your work, um, you know, especially up in, in Seattle and the Pacific Northwest, there are a lot of uh, Central and South American Indigenous peoples in, 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 in your communities, you know, um, and so including them in your understanding of Indigenous and who is Indigenous is, is vital. Uh, in terms of just the numbers, you know, there's 5.2 million people who self-identified as American Indian or Alaska Native in the census, in the in the 2010 census. Um, that's just less than 2% of the population. And so, you know, that 5.2 million, not all of those individuals have a tribal affiliation. Many of those individuals identified as more than one race. So they, they identified as American Indian and another race, whether it be white or black um, or Asian. Um, this population grew significantly. So we're seeing a growth in the indigenous population, not necessarily in terms of uh, this kind of natural increase where, you know, there are more Indigenous babies being born, but that is the case as well. Um, but we're seeing an increase in the number of people who did not previously identify as American Indian or Alaska Native in previous censuses who are now identifying as that. Um, and so there's this kind of uh, reclaiming of, of, of identity that's happening in this country. And um, uh, the majority are living outside of American Indian and Alaska Native areas, so reservations, homelands, these uh, statistical areas that the government declares are American Indian and Alaska Native. As you guys know, so many are in urban areas. Um, and um, but we're also seeing that counties that have the highest proportions of American Indians and Alaska Natives are close to reservations. So there's still mean there's still a lot of mobility happening between reservations and urban and rural areas. Um, American Indians are a very mobile population. We're going back and forth a lot between reservations and cities and towns. Um, I want to talk about what this notion of peoplehood means. So beyond a racial category, indigenous identity is this political classification. And that refers to the continuity of these distinct collectives that predate the founding of the United States, the settler colonial state. Um, Je uh, Cherokee scholar Jeff Korntassel talks about indigenous peoplehood as, as you know, these concepts, these interlocking concepts of history and ceremonies and language and homelands, um, and that we have to really look at all of these different interlocking concepts um, to understand what peoplehood means. It's not just this population that exists for counting and classification. Um, and so in the United States, you'll see here that if we're to look at where American Indians and Alaska Natives are living, um, you know, they are absolutely um, concentrated in certain states. So Montana, where I'm at right now, we have a high, a high concentration, North Dakota, South Dakota, um, but also Washington and Oregon and Idaho and kind of that Pacific Northwest down into the Southwest, right? Arizona, New Mexico, um, Oklahoma, which was once Indian territory, right? Where tribes were removed and, uh, and forced to, um, to try to survive Many tribes just stayed there, not because they weren't, um, because they wanted to, you know, it was because ultimately they were forced to stay there and they've, you know, over generations have remained. Um, also, Alaska have, you know, a significant number, um, almost, uh, almost half the tribes in this country are in Alaska. So I want to talk about Washington because this is the context in which you guys are living and working. And I know many of you know this, um, but Washington has a, a very large number of native nations, 29 native nations in the state of Washington, um, ranging from the Cowlitz down south, right? All the way up to um, the upper Skagit and the Swinomish and the Macaw up, up in the north. Um, and it's, uh, Washington is a unique context for um, native nations. And I say that with a lot of respect because uh, Native nations in Washington have a tremendous amount of power and a tremendous amount of leverage um, that uh, tribes across the country, many do not have. 
um, a lot of that comes from the um, economic base of uh, tribes in Washington. So you'll see here just, you know, um, some brief uh, facts and some kind of infographics showing that, you know, uh, Washington tribes employ more than 30,000 people, right? There's, uh, they generate 700 and over 700 million in, in, in revenue, for tax revenue. Um, you'll see here that, you know, they pay billions of dollars into wages and benefits. Um, they add billions of dollars to the state economy um, and that they are charitable, that they are giving money back into local communities. Um, this is a, a point of difference, I think, that needs to be absolutely um, uh, pointed out for Washington and, and to really understand the value and the political power um, that Washington tribes do have within the state and the federal context. The total population in Washington of American Indians and Alaska Natives is almost 200,000. Um, it's the sixth largest population of any state. Um, we, we see here that the majority live in urban areas. Um, King County has a large percentage, a large number of American Indians and Alaska Natives, um, both in combination. So those who identify as more than one race, American Indian and white, American Indian and black, American Indian and Asian, American Indian and Latinx, um, as well as those who see that they are only American Indian and Alaska Native. And I give you this, and this is all probably a bit of a um, of a review, but I, I I give you that context because I want us to really understand sovereignty and to understand that sovereignty is alive today. Uh, it is it is being practiced and exercised right now, all the time by the more than five hundred tribal nations in this country. Um, that uh, you know, tribal sovereignty is also called autonomy, self determination, control, and it describes the authority of Native nations to protect and promote their health and the welfare of their citizens. Um, and it comes out of this. Um, this article section one, section eight of the US Constitution establishes this government to government relationship between native nations and the United States government. Um, hundreds of treaties were negotiated uh, based on tribal sovereignty in return for land. Um, and that, that there's a federal trust responsibility for health and education and social services to be provided. Now, all of this is important, but what I want to build off of. Um, I want to build off of tribal sovereignty because I want to talk about where data fit in. And so data on citizens, on lands, on resources are critical to the exercise of sovereignty for any nation state, whether it be, you know, a, a, a native nation, whether it be the United States government, whether it be France or Germany or Brazil, data on our citizens, lands, resources, that's all a critical part of governance. Um, and Native nations are no different. But the problem is that Native nations, right, have had this deliberate, there's been a deliberate and intentional um, effort to destroy, to destroy lands, to destroy peoples, to destroy connections to all of, uh, uh, you know, our relations to the non-human world, to our lands, water, air. Um, and so I want to share this graphic here because it really visualizes the, the attempted destruction and the massive loss. Um, so this just basically charts, you know, kind of the um, how prior to invasion, right, indigenous peoples controlled all of these lands uh, in what is currently called the United States. But um, really over just a very short period of time, you know, just a couple of hundred years now, we're seeing, you know, how indigenous lands in terms of the lands we have control over are just uh, very much dispersed into small pockets across this country. Um, but we have 574 federally recognized tribes, 326 reservations, and we still retain control over about 50 million acres. So I want to share this quote about tribal sovereignty. It's this quote by um, the former tribal chairman of my tribe, the Northern Cheyenne Nation, John Robinson. I worked with him very closely as his advisor when he was uh, served our people. And he said that tribal sovereignty is only as strong as we exercise it. So this exercise of sovereignty must happen. Um, and by exercising tribal sovereignty, 
um, we are actually strengthening it, which then gives us even more uh, authority to continue to exercise. So it's kind of this um, self-reinforcing relationship. Um, and I want to talk about how, you know, I, I bring up this exercise of tribal sovereignty that we need to exercise it. Um, we need to exercise it in all different spheres. Um, and a couple of the spheres that I want to specifically, um, uh, you know, kind of focus on is health, the health sphere. So we all know, or at least if, if you don't know, I'm going to tell you um, that health disparities in Indian country are significant. The indigenous population in this country continues to experience some of the, most, the poorest health outcomes of any group um, in this country. And so I just want to share a couple of slides that show, you know, um, health status and rates of chronic disease, right? We see here that American Indians and Alaska Natives are overrepresented in diabetes, in heart disease, in mental distress, um, in obesity. Um, just, you know, one example. Uh, another example here, you know, um, 13% of the United States, excuse me, 1.3% of the population identifies as American Indian, um, but yet 19% report uh, mental illness. So there's, you know, uh, something happening with respect to mental health disparities as well as the physical health disparities. Um, again, here, you know, deaths per 100,000 and Native peoples, we are overrepresented in all sorts of different causes of mortality from heart disease to cancer, to diabetes, to accidents. Um, uh, you, know, you know, these are just examples of, of the data that reflect um, how, you know, over 500 years of, of colonialism have impacted our health as Indigenous peoples. And I want to talk about this kind of current, um, you know, crisis that we're in, this pandemic, and how the data are pointing to very stark impacts of COVID-19 on Indigenous peoples. You know, we're seeing here in Arizona, New Mexico, Wyoming, um, disproportionate percentages of deaths and of um, incidents of COVID, you know, across uh, four Native peoples compared to um, their population in these states. And so the health disparities are significant. They are vast. Um, you know, we are dying at high rates of all sorts of preventable illnesses. Um, we know, um, you know, we, we know the state of play for Indigenous peoples with respect to health. Um, but what do we do about it, right? Um, and so here is a, a graphic that's often um, shared by lots of different health researchers and health practitioners and providers that talks about, well, you know, there's a difference between equality and equity, right? Equality meaning everybody has a, this equal chance at uh, whatever it may be. In this case, it's seeing the baseball game. Um, but equity is a different concept entirely. It's a completely different paradigm whereby we are ensuring that certain peoples or certain groups of peoples um, who have had less access um, you know, to whatever it may be um, as a result of these structural inequalities that we are um, creating equitable chances by building up you know, certain groups or certain peoples higher than others because of this kind of structural nature, the in, the, how inequality is structured in this country. Um, well, I want to share this, which is um, by some colleagues of mine who said, well, actually, at the end of the day, um, we need to actually go one step further from that initial equity um, discussion and talk about how, you know, we have biased foundational beliefs about innate differences in value or in merit that undermines a lot of these equity-based interventions. So you'll see here, you know, that there's an individual who is, you know, actually in the ground, buried in the ground, you know, so many feet. Like they can't, there's no way that they're going to be able to see above that, uh, that fence, right? You have somebody here on the right, you know, who is literally shackled. There's no way they can get up and see above that fence. Um, and you have another person here in the middle, right, who is on a platform enjoying themselves. Um, and so this kind of speaks to the real deep structural inequalities um, that persist in this country that are really rooted in the founding of this country. Um, and Indigenous peoples um, have a stake in this. And that stake is... Um, is really, you know, like I said, we see it with the health disparities. We also see it in the data disparities. And so 
I want to talk now about the data disparities that we see. And so uh, I'm just going to provide just an example being the COVID-19 pandemic right now and, and just the real limited access to data, um, the issues that we're facing in terms of being able to get tribes data on their, on their citizens to be able to um, do the analyses that are needed to save lives. Um, here's an example of, of a project that I finished with some colleagues where we were looking at tribal data in a time of COVID and trying to understand kind of these early infection rates. This was back in April, which seems like, you know, lifetimes ago in, in this pandemic. Um, but we were trying to figure out, okay, how can we find out data on tribes? How can we figure out how to, you know, connect tribes and link them to the data that's being collected already? What do we know? What are the data telling us? Um, and so we were able to show that, you know, though the data were very limited, we were able to find that, you know, there is uh, some, co some correlates that we could find with these early infection rates that are, um, you know, around indoor plumbing, you know, lack of indoor plumbing uh, did result in, in a higher incidence of COVID-19 on tribal lands. Um, and then we also found that, um, in households where other languages besides English are spoken, that there are also higher um, incidents of COVID-19, um, being that you know the, the majority of these public health messaging, at least early on in the pandemic, wasn't being provided in languages other than English. Um, but so that was kind of this initial: how do we get the data? What do we do? Um, but there was, you know, it's been such. Um, uh, a case in point, this, this, this data in the time of COVID has really shown how data in this country for Indigenous peoples are being used um, to erase, to terrorize, to threaten sovereignty of Native peoples and, and Native nations. Um, I don't know how many of you guys know, but there was a massive data breach um, where tribal nations had to submit data to the federal government in order to um, qualify for relief funding from the CARES Act. You know, state governments didn't have to do this, but the federal government required tribal governments to do this. Give us all of your data before we'll even consider you for any sort of relief aid. Um, and then when tribes sent them all of that data, which included very proprietary information about taxes and revenue streams and per capita information, um, somehow all of that data got leaked within the federal government. It was a massive, massive uh, breach of data, um, of uh, a breach of, of sovereignty, tribal sovereignty. Um, and so I give these examples because I want to hit home that there is no tribal data standard in this country that governs or prevents those type of things from happening, what we just, what I just went through, those types of data breaches, that type of limited data access. Um, there's no standard for the collection of tribal affiliation, enrollment status, or even race in vital statistics and national surveys for American Indians and Alaska Natives. We can't separate, you know, um, we can't identify tribal citizens, you know, their deaths over time. Um, and ultimately, a lot of, you know, these health surveillance systems and mortality and birth systems, you know, these vital statistics, they need to be collecting some sort of standardized data, um, and they're not. Um, and so that really points to a huge gap. And it points to a huge gap for those of us who are data users, who analyze data. We need to be very critical about the sources of the data that are being used, um, how they're collected, who's missing. You know, that's one of my biggest um uh, you know, one of the biggest parts of the work that I do is, yes, I care about who's counted. I care about who's classified in the census and in all of these different surveys, but I'm most interested in who's not being counted um, and that we need to really start thinking about who is not included. And that extends far beyond Indigenous peoples. You know, it includes people who experience homelessness. It includes a lot of veterans in this country, young children, um, undocumented migrants. Um, we know who's not being counted. Um, and so we need to be very critical of, of the data that we're using uh, through that lens. Um, so ultimately, we have this lack of data infrastructure and capability across Indian country that's really um, you know, per, uh, creating these kind of barriers to a lot of this. Um, we see that, you know, um, collecting data, accessing, analyzing it, it's very resource intensive. But so many tribes and communities, as you guys likely know, um, are often in crisis management, mo management mode, right? They're 
they've got competing priorities that they're trying to meet, often with very limited resources, and that there's been a, a lack of funding for data for a very long time. Um, so how do we, what do we do given all of these um, realities? Um, well, this is where Indigenous data sovereignty and governance comes into play. So um, I want to share this quote by another tribal leader that I worked with who asked to remain anonymous, but he said, you know, Desi, when I think about data and I think about sovereignty as, as tribes, I, I think about how sovereignty as tribal nations was given to us by the creator. It is sacred. And so data then to exercise our sovereignty is also sacred. So thinking about how data can support sovereignty is a sacred act. Um, it is so critical um, to governance. And it, mean, and it needs to be treated with that level of respect. Um, and this goes back to the fact that our peoples, indigenous peoples, have always been data experts, always. We've used data, we've analyzed data, collected data, interpreted it for all sorts of things, for survival from the very beginning. Um, and this, these are just some examples, you know, of, of these um, data instruments. You know, we've got the totem poles from the Pacific Northwest, the winter counts of the Plains Indian tribes, which remain some of the most complex instruments of, of early census collection ever in the world. Um, you have the, the Optum calendar stick here um, on the other side and the Haudenosaunee, the uh, wampum belt down below. You know, all indigenous peoples have examples of how they have uh, been experts in data, data collection and analyses um, since the very beginning. But unfortunately, as a result of over 500 years of colonialism, at least in this country, in the United States, Tribes, indigenous peoples, communities are at different stages of what um, we call data dependency. This dependency on external entities for information, for data, for knowledge on their peoples, their lands, their resources. Um, some tribes are very dependent, so they're completely reliant on, you know, the federal government or local and state uh, agencies for data. Other tribes have um, definitely departed from data dependency and they're on this path of reclamation, so reclaiming Indigenous data sovereignty. Um, and so, you know, we've got tribes and, and, and communities all across this spectrum. But um, I want to point to these kind of two interlocking forces that uh, Indigenous peoples are reclaiming Indigenous data sovereignty through two main mechanisms. One being decolonizing data, so decolonizing existing data systems, um, and then governing in, uh, Indigenous data. So what are Indigenous data? Indigenous data are data, information, knowledge uh, in any format. So not just digital format, any format that impacts Indigenous peoples, nations, communities at the collective and individual levels. It's very broad. It's a very deliberately broad statement. Um, this statement was informed by uh, the BC, British Columbia First Nations Data Governance Institute up in Canada. Um, it refers to data about resources and environments. It refers to data about Native peoples as individuals, as well as Native peoples as collectives, as nations. And it's, uh, as you'll see, it is very different from how we conceptualize data from a Western perspective. And that's, uh, that's intentional. And indigenous data sovereignty then is the is comes from this right. It's a emerges from a rights-based framework, which we draw on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It's the right of indigenous peoples and nations to govern the collection, the ownership, and the application of their own data. I I often like to refer to this pyramid, this kind of paradigm, this data paradigm, because it shows where we've been and where we're going it, with respect to Indigenous data. Um, this state of data dependency, right, is, um, is where a lot of tribes still are, where a lot of communities remain, this relying on data um, that uh, has been collected by others, um, for others. Um, and so you'll see here, that's where that next rung is, that by them, 
for them about us, by non-Indigenous peoples, for non-Indigenous peoples, about Indigenous peoples. And we start working our way up this data paradigm to by them, so by Indigenous people, uh, by non-Indigenous peoples, for Indigenous peoples, so kind of in this very paternalistic, um, you know, uh, a paternalistic relationship. Uh, well, the Indians or the natives, they can't collect these data very well, so we're going to do it for them. Um, and that's, you know, been the policy of a lot of federal government agencies for a very long time, a lot of state and county agencies for a very long time. Um, but we're moving away from that. So now we're seeing, you know, by them with us, by non-Indigenous peoples, with Indigenous peoples. So some sort of partnership arrangement, whether it be, you know, uh, in consultation, whether there is an actual true partnership, um, you know, it, it, whether there's co-governance, the, the, the degree to which there is some sort of authority and control varies. Um, and then we get to this by us, for us. This is where um, Indigenous data sovereignty becomes reclaimed, where Indigenous peoples are collecting data, doing data by them, for them. Um, and I like to include this top rung, um, which a colleague, uh, Kim Tallbear, had kind of pushed us on, who said, well, at the end of the day, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't we want to get to this place where it's by Indigenous peoples for everyone? But at the end of the day, Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous data can be used to save all of us at the end of the day. And we see that happening, particularly in that climate change and a lot of the climate change work. We saw it very clearly in, you know, the massive forest fires in Northern California, drawing on Indigenous knowledge systems. Um, we see it in so many different sectors that, you know, this ultimate rung is data by Indigenous peoples for everyone. Um, and so I want to kind of just wrap up by talking about Indigenous data governance. And so governance, Indigenous data governance is this means of implementing greater Indigenous data sovereignty. It's the actions that must happen um, and the application of Indigenous ways of knowing and doing to the management and the control of Indigenous data. Uh, it includes data about citizens, communities, resources, and lands, but the nation is at the center. Native nations are at the center of Indigenous data governance. Um, and, it, and it's founded on relationships. So I want to go back to that very, very first slide that I talked about where ultimately sovereignty is about relationships and so is governance. And so we need to think about how are we enhancing data relationships? On the one end, we've got data stewards who would be all of us who are non-Native nations uh, who are engaging in some sort of data practice. Um, how do we get data stewards to start managing data by tribal standards? And on the other side of that is how do we get tribes to start governing tribal data uh, according to their sovereign uh, practices. So there's this kind of two-way street that uh, the relationships need to go both ways. Um, and so I really want to hit home that there are stakeholders in this process and that there are rights holders. And the stakeholders are intertribal entities, urban communities, um, NGOs, advocacy organizations, other governments, other institutions, academia, scholars, um, policy advocates. We're all stakeholders, practitioners, providers, but the rights holders are, in this specific instance, with respect to Indigenous data sovereignty, the rights holders are Native nations, whether they be federally recognized, state recognized, non-recognized, the, the collectives, the tribal collectives are the rights holders. And we can start to, we can start to govern data. You know, we can, Native nations can start to govern their data um, by following, you know, kind of this outline. We go from values and principles to institutions and decision-making structures to policies and procedures. And we're seeing it happening through lots of different mechanisms. Tribes are looking, you know, developing MOAs and MOUs. They're developing cultural protocols. They're moving forward with legislation, with data sharing agreements, with co-governance arrangements. Um, there's lots of different mechanisms that are being used. Um, and so I want to, talk about how governance is this act of harnessing, harnessing tribal values and principles and mechanisms. And tribes are doing it right now. And so here are some examples of how that's happening. 
So tribes, uh, this is an example of a big policy, pro a big research project, um, excuse me, of a big research project done uh, with the National Congress of American Indians. So I led this big survey to evaluate how tribes are using data. How are they accessing it? What are they accessing? How are they using it for governance? And we found all sorts of amazing things from hundreds of native nations, you know, that um, tribes are saying that, you know, there needs to be more federal investment to support tribal data collection, um, that there needs to be, you know, an integration of program funds for comprehensive data, um, that there needs to be partnerships, um, and that there needs to be intertribal forums, that they're really, you know, tribes need to be working together to do a lot of this. Um, we found that, you know, the majority, 83% of tribes who responded they, to the survey, they said that it's extremely important for tribes to collect or have access to data for, uh, for governance purposes, you know, that data and governance go hand in hand. Um, we found that there's all sorts of ways and that tribes are using data. They're using data for, of course, federal grant requirements, but they're using it also to communicate with tribal members. They're using it to, you know, improve service delivery, to set priorities and goals, to develop budgets. Um, tribes are complex. They're dynamic. They are using all, you know, data for all sorts of things. Um, we also found that, you know, there's lots of things happening in tribal data management that, you know, tribes are saying they do have a central data office or some sort of hub and that they do have data sharing agreements as well. Um, and fewer, but still, um, there's still a decent number say that they have some sort of um, a review board, some sort of research ethics process at the tribal level. And so I want us to be cognizant of, you know, that tribes are doing data. Tribes are exercising their sovereignty in this space and that as stakeholders, we must figure out how to fall in line with uh, tribal data sovereignty. And the way that we do that, um, here's just a couple more examples. Uh, this is the, the Taos Pueblo. They're doing some amazing stuff um, oh, uh, down there in New Mexico. Um, we have the climate change initiative um, amongst the Swinomish people up in Washington. Um, they're working in collaboration with other tribes, you know, intertribal collaboration um, that is really powerful. Um, here's an example of, of a project with my own nation where we're working with, I'm um, working with our tribe, my tribe to do uh, population projections and to start rethinking how we conceptualize tribal belonging and blood quantum and how we can sustain our tribal population in the long run. Um, so tribes are doing all sorts of amazing things. Um, and again, it gets back to relationships. So um, what does this mean for all of us, all of us stakeholders? Well, realizing uh, Indigenous data governance requires us to move from principles into policy and then into practice. And uh, principles have been developed. And so I want to talk about um, how we put this into practice. It can be put into practice through law, through policy, through ethics, through different types of infrastructures. Um, that non-Indigenous entities, just as well as Indigenous entities or intertribal entities can start doing this work. Um, and so here are these data principles. There's lots of data principles that have been developed. Um, data principles that have been developed in New Zealand, in Australia, in the United States, um, as well as over here in Canada. Some of you may be familiar with some of these, for example, OCAP, ownership, control, access, and protection. Um, that's a trademark um, that the uh, uh, that the Canadian First Nations use to control um, their data up in Canada. That's it's been used now for um, you know decades, uh, and so. But other other contexts, other pe you know, Indigenous peoples and other settler contexts have adopted data principles as well. And you'll see that there's a lot of kind of similarities, you know, authority, self-determination, sovereignty, this notion of control is built in. We see here that there has to be some sort of relationships or benefit or reciprocity um, as well. And I talk about these indigenous data principles because I want to juxtapose or compare them to the mainstream. Mainstream data principles are all around us, all, you know, from all the different industries, all different types of, um, you know, data, uh, data principles across, you know, the kind of data landscape. 
Um, we see here that there's open data principles. Um, there's these principles for commoditized and industrial data. Um, one of the most popular and probably most um, well known is the FAIR principles that talks about, you know, um, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, that data should have all of these qualities. Um, and ultimately, though, what makes Indigenous principles different is that they are people oriented, very different than uh, mainstream principles. And so this leads me to talking about how um, there's this huge push in the Indigenous data world to get stakeholders and rights holders to uh, when they are adopting fair, the FAIR principles for, for their data practices, that they're also adopting these indigenous care principles. And so these indigenous care principles are a set of international indigenous data governance principles that have now been ratified by many different um, uh, indigenous data sovereignty groups across the world and in different uh, settler contexts. And there are four principles. One, is, the first is collective benefit. So we're calling on um, entities to adopt this principle of collective benefit. That means that their data will be used for inclusive development and innovation, that, that, that data will be used to improve governance and citizen engagement, and that it will be used for equitable outcomes. Uh, then we call on uh, the, the authority to control. So recognizing that there are rights and interests to indigenous data that lie beyond stakeholders. Um, recognizing that data for governance and governance of data um, are required in this uh, control environment and that Native nations have that control. Third, we are calling on the acknowledgement of responsibility that we as data stewards have a responsibility for positive relationships, right? Use the data for good and not harm, um, for expanding capability and capacity. At some point we should all, we you know, in the communities that we work with and in, in, our, in our areas of, uh, our, of expertise, we should be uh, preparing and training new generations of folks to do this work. Um, you know, expanding capability and capacity, uh, and then to then have a responsibility for indigenous languages and worldviews um, that is so critical to um, maintaining, uh, you know, the distinctiveness of indigenous peoples. Uh, and then finally, this kind of guiding principle of ethics, ethics for minimizing harm, maximizing benefit, for justice and for, for future use, for sustainability. So these are the care principles that I want to leave you with because um, we did a practice with some of the Healthier Here staff last week to really start to think about how these principles can be used in your respective areas of work and with, and with your projects and how, um, you know, Adopting the care principles is not only good for indigenous peoples and for your relationships with native nations, but it's good for everybody. These are all, you know, these principles, if they are adopted and used and actioned with respect to data, can result in, you know, more equitable outcomes for everybody. And how it works is we see here, you know, that care principles, they are people and purpose oriented. They reflect the crucial role of data in advancing innovation and governance and self-determination for Indigenous peoples. And they rely on Indigenous communities and, you know, these non-Indigenous research and data communities to come together to understand these concepts and apply them across all sorts of data ecosystems. And so this really aligns with the work of, you know, the Connect to Community, the, the, the Community Information Exchange, is that how do we bring together Indigenous communities, Indigenous ways of knowing and doing and being, and, you know, this broader data community um, that is serving both Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. We can replicate that model in all sorts of different work areas. Um, and that it requires opportunities, right? We have to create these opportunities uh, for understanding um, amongst non-Indigenous peoples. And that's what I hope this Q&A will be, is to really start to think about what are, um, what are some questions that, you know, you have and how do we start creating opportunities to ask questions? Um, 
And that the takeaway is that what is good for indigenous peoples in this country and in this world is good for everybody. Um, and you know, similarly, uh, it's not just indigenous peoples. We need to be thinking about who are the most marginalized of the marginalized uh, you know, that we serve in our work. Who is not counted? Who is absent? Who, you know, who, who are completely erased and invisible um, in, our, in our work and in what we do? And how do we serve them? Um, and if we can serve those individuals and those communities, uh, then we are on the path towards equity um, for all of us. And so some early adopters of the care principles um, have been this global um, research data alliance community that's now across you know, you know, know, all kinds of different countries. Um, basically this community of data scientists who have said, okay, we're going to adopt these principles um, in our work. Um, the Smithsonian Institution has adopted it, the Open Data Charter. Um, and I think that it's an exciting opportunity to also see how Healthier Here is starting to think about incorporating this into uh, all of your guys' work um, and in you know your partnerships as well. Um, so I want to just leave uh, everything there. Um, encourage you all that if you know this webinar has been helpful, if you found anything of use or you know you want to learn more that we do have this network here in the US, the United States Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network. It's non-indigenous and indigenous peoples coming together, policymakers, um, you know, community folks who are in community doing the work on the ground, academics, students, um, tribal leaders. We've got over 300 people who are part of this network and um, we try to help each other and, and try to figure out how to amplify each other's work and e each other's, you know, um, issues um, and to advocate. And so, um, you know, there's the link down there if you guys want to want to join and kind of follow the work. Um, there's no like leaders necessarily. Everybody is a part of the network um, who wants to be. Uh, and then of course the Data Warriors Lab. So this is my lab that's based at UCLA. Um, but we've got partnerships with um, you know, different tribal communities. The hope is to really expand to tribal colleges and universities. Um, at some point, I'm gonna get my CDL and get a bus and we're gonna go on the road and create a traveling lab and go into communities and figure out how to build data by indigenous peoples for indigenous peoples and really um, you know, work with our young people who have um, so many skills already that we can tap into to build data warriors. So if that also interests you, I'd be very happy to talk with you more about that um, as well. Um, but I just want to leave it here and open it up for questions and just remind everyone that, you know, when you're thinking about equity and justice, think also about what sovereignty means in, in, in your work and, and in, in your relationships. Um, and that sovereignty starts and ends with these relationships. Um, how, do we be good, how do we be good relatives? Um, I always tell people that, yes, I'm a researcher, I'm a teacher, uh, I'm all of these things, but beyond that, I'm a relative and uh, I have to figure out how to maintain uh, relationships. Otherwise, I can't do the work that I do with any sort of integrity. Um, and I urge all of you to consider um, how you do that as well. So I want to say mia'ish, which is thank you in my language for uh, listening and being on this call. And, and I hope to take questions, but I'll leave it to Lisa to, to navigate that. So thanks, Lisa. I'll stop sharing. <laughs>